Well, hello, my name's Julie McCrossan and I'm here at the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute uh, with Ovarian Cancer Australia and an audience of women who've had a diagnosis of ovarian cancer and their friends and family. And we've been answering questions we've received from women all over the country. And, and with me is Jane Hill, the CEO of Ovarian Cancer Australia, who has a legal background and engagement with a whole range of uh, community organisations to make it a better world. I think I'll sum it up like that. Would you please give her a warm round of applause? <laughs> now, one of the uh, issues that, the, well, there were really three issues that were raised by women uh, repeatedly. One was, what are we doing to build knowledge in the community about ovarian cancer, uh, its signs and symptoms, its treatment, its research, uh, and what we can do to help women living with it? So one was, building community knowledge. And the second was all about professional knowledge, particularly general practitioners who are so crucial in that initial identification and referral. What more can we do to ensure that general practitioners and other clinicians are fully aware of the signs and symptoms of ovarian cancer so women can be referred for help as quickly as possible? And then finally, people said, what can we do to help? So I thought we'll go through each of those, but let's begin with research because we've heard today just how critical that is for improving treatment. Tell us, Jane, what uh, Ovarian Cancer Australia is doing in the area of research. Thanks, Julie. Um, well, Ovarian Cancer Australia, uh, two years ago, established the National Action Plan for Medical Research into Ovarian Cancer. And this was a plan, it's ambitious, and it has the support of over 50 of the research institutes around the country and, and all the main uh, researchers in the country. So it is a blueprint on how research should be conducted. And I'm so heartened also by those researchers that you've heard about uh, from today. We have in Australia the best lot of researchers and the effort is truly amazing. When you say you'll get uh, government dollars for research matched, what are you referring to there? Is it about going to other governments or is it going to corporations? How do you get it matched? Well, there's a lot of social capital about in Australia and some of it is, um, it flies underneath the radar. There's a lot of uh, wealthy people in Australia and when they see that a government is prepared to put put their money where their mouth is, they say, and there is a, a ambitious and, and well set out plan, which Ovarian Cancer Australia does have for research. Mm. They think, yeah, we're going to back this. So it could come from, you know, individual philanthropists. It could come from corporations. It could uh, come from state governments. But I really do think that there is momentum that has been started you must have seen the, the news, or I hope you saw the news, when the PM cried um, during our, uh, our Teal Ribbon Day breakfast when he heard the account of Anne-Marie Malders. Um, and that made national TV. And I still see all of the parliamentarians still wearing teal ribbons. Um, there's been a lot that's been going on in, in the last year. And when you have those breakfasts at Parliament House in Canberra, you invite people from across the political spectrum. I'm assuming you, you aim it to be multi-partisan and, and to get them all informed about the importance of getting resources to ovarian cancer. That's right, and it was very bipartisan. Um, we had the leader of the opposition there and um, Tanya Plebisek, um, from uh, the government, there was um, obviously the Prime Minister, Lucy Turnbull, the Minister for Women, Michaelia Cash, Julie Bishop, Kelly O'Dwyer. You know, really uh, the, the, uh, the doyens of politics were there and they were all there to support ovarian cancer. Now, again, in the questions we receive from across the country, people want a national campaign. They want publicity of the signs and symptoms. They want TV ads and billboards, uh, co corporate sponsorship and nationwide fundraising. To what degree is that all happening already? Well, there is a lot happening, but there's still a lot more to come. Um, our work goes across advocacy, research, 
um, awareness and support. So there's a lot happening in all of those areas. But what is so encouraging is all of the, the help that we get, you know, from across, you know, all the volunteers, our ambassadors, we need that in order to do the work. And when it comes to building professional knowledge, are you particularly focusing on general practitioners? Well, we hope to do that. Um, at the moment, we're looking at all, all across just building public awareness generally, mm -hmm. but we, we have just um, commenced work on our new strategic plan um, for the next four years, and GPs are, you know, a part of that. We need to make sure that they're, they're more aware there are challenges there, of course, because most GPs will only um, see ovarian cancer perhaps twice in their career. Um, so that is a challenge, but still, you know, we need to get the awareness out. I, I, I saw a few people flinch at that bit of information, but uh, I, I, uh, I've heard that many times, that reality is for the individual practitioner, they will only have very few patients who actually have ovarian cancer. And as we know, many of the signs and symptoms of ovarian cancer can be of many other things. So early diagnosis is a, is a, is a genuine challenge, which is why I think so much of that scientific work we heard about earlier today is so important. But look, in the limited time we have, give us a couple of examples of work you've done in advocacy to raise awareness and get people active for women with ovarian cancer. Well, um, this year um, we were very proud um, to go to a consumer hearing of PBAC. That's the Pharmaceutical Benefits Advisory Committee. And uh, remind us what they do. Um, they consider drugs uh, for listing on the PBS. So uh, Ovarian Cancer Australia was invited to the, the consumer hearing and uh, we're one of, one of the first organisations ever to get a consumer hearing at the Pharmaceutical Benefits Advisory Committee and we argued very strongly there for a listing of a drug um, and um, it, the drug wasn't going to save um, the lives of women but it provided a quality of life for an average of about seven months for women. Mm -hmm. And our women told us that that was very, very important to them and that this drug should receive listing. Do we know the result? We don't know the result yet. Um, the result has been deferred whilst um, the, um, the bureaucrats uh, consider it mm -hmm. and uh, talk to the pharmaceutical company. Um, but. Uh, we don't know the result, but we hope that it will be positive. And my understanding is this is critical because there are some medications that may help a, a woman, but unless they're on the pharmaceutical benefit scheme, you would have to pay for them yourselves. And there are circumstances in which people even mortgage their homes to purchase medications. That's correct, isn't it? That is correct, yes. So th this sort of advocacy is critical. Could you give us another example of, of that sort of advocacy for the women? Yes, um, just last year we attended a, a Senate Standing Committee and they were considering new and innovative drugs. And again, it's so important for us to get access to those new and innovative drugs that are available in the US um, or England, you know, we need those drugs here. So we were arguing very strongly um, about that policy needs to change. You start to see why having someone with a legal background is useful in this role. There is a lot of almost arguing the case with decision makers. Isn't it? It certainly is, um, and we have to keep going um, to see government all the time um, to, to put ovarian cancer in their minds. Just finally and quickly, examples of what you're doing to give support to women with a diagnosis and their families. Well, this is perhaps one example today, and I thank everyone for your attendance. Um, we have a resilience kit that's available um, for newly diagnosed women. Um, and it gives you a whole lot of information about what to expect. Uh, we've got support groups, 
a 1300 um, telephone line. Um, we've now got webinars, so stay tuned for those. And so a webinar is you can go onto your computer and at a certain time or sometimes later they're uh, available, we've seen uh, multiple times, they'll be like the sort of chat we've been doing today will be out on the internet for people to watch in various parts of the country, even other parts of the world. Yes, and also stay tuned for our online forum because that'll be starting up soon. Uh, David Botel we spoke to earlier today and he, he had the impression that Avarian Cancer Australia was boosting your social media use, trying to get more out. Is, is that right? We certainly are. We're trying to use social media um, and technology better because we want to connect women to other women and uh, we want to make sure that you've got access to the knowledge that you need. Well, just finally, what can we do if you're wanting to help raise awareness, let politicians and companies and individuals with assets know why they should invest in ovarian cancer. What can we do to help you? Well, there's many different ways that you can help and we do have a sheet out on, on the a table outside with um, examples of the way that you can help. But uh, Imogen, um, who presented earlier today, she talked about our Ovarian Cancer Awareness Month. And that's our big um, campaign. Uh, um, it's in February and we are looking for people that have stories to tell because we, we want a bank of, of different stories and then we put that out to media. And um, this year we got more than 1,000 um, media stories out there, which is pretty impressive. Um, for such a small organisation. Um, so that, that is one excellent way that, that um, people may be able to help us. As, as someone who's worked for many years in the media, there's nothing like a personal story. Uh, I, I have been doing some of that in relation to my own cancer history and it is a bit of an emotional thing to do, I, I have to tell you. Uh, but uh, the, in terms of attracting the attention of decision makers and getting awareness, there's nothing like a person talking about the direct personal experience. Look, I'd like to ask you to thank Jane Hill from Ovarian Cancer Australia.